Good evening, wherever you are. So welcome to Antioch Bible Study. We bless the Lord our God for the gift of another day, another Monday, where we are gathered together to fellowship in his name. We bless the Lord indeed. Hallelujah. And our studies continue in the Gospel of John. Let us bow our heads to pray. King immortal, invisible, the only true God, the rule and the possessor of all heaven and earth, the one who has sent your only begotten son to the world, that we may have life. Lord Jesus, you came as the son of God to the sons of men, so that the sons of men can become sons of God. Oh, may we become more like you today, like never before. For it is in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, we continue our studies as we read from John chapter 1, verse 12. Picking up from where we stopped last week. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. This is the new Revised Standard Version. Who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth, however, came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son, who is close to the Father's heart. He has made him known. Amen. 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 In our last study, we focused on the power to become children of God. Power, inner strength, or inner might is indispensable to any form of meaningful Christian life. The pressures of sin, the pressures of the world and the devil, they can be quite enormous and overwhelming. But with the release of God's power and wisdom, the Christian is able to stand clear of sin and evil and to go forward to manifest that very life of our Lord Jesus Christ in the world. Right into the Romans, the Apostle Paul stated that the kingdom of God is about righteousness, it's about peace, it's about joy in the Holy Ghost. Those who become children of God through Christ know the very tough struggle, and they also know the victory over sin, the world, and the devil. In the struggle over sin, the power of the Holy Spirit is needed to mortify the lusts of the flesh and so quell what I may call its nuisance phenomenon. In the struggle with the world, the Holy Spirit quells the lusts of the eyes through godliness with contentment that drives our thoughts and feelings away from the lusts that come through long games. In the struggle with the pride of life, the Holy Spirit releases humility, meekness, and selflessness that cause a paradigm shift 
so we can contain the pressures of the pride of life. But do we understand what it means to be born of God? The Bible says that when you come to Christ, you are born of God. Now, so let's take a moment and look at children of God that are born of God. Let us take care to tease apart this concept of being a child of God that is born of God. A child of God that is born of God is distinct from a child of God that is created by God. Some people will say these are creatures of God rather than children of God. Well, created by God, children of God, yes, but there's a distinction. The principle of the reproductive process is embedded in the genes. God created the first man, Adam. We are told that he molded his biological and histological structure from the dust of the ground in Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. When the spirit of God came into the man, function or life was begun. Now, through biological reproduction, Adam and Eve are being recreated in children that are born into the world. They are children of God in a physical sense, created by God. However, what our Lord Jesus came to do was to raise men and women who are born of God after they have been born biologically. And because they are born of God, they have the seed of the life of God in them. Now, the Apostle John referred to this in 1 John 3.9 where he said, whoever has been born of God does not sin because he has been born of God. Some translations um, say whoever is born of God cannot make a habit of sin because he's born of God, because the seed of God is in him. Children of God have the life of God in them here called the seed. This is a revelation of the divinity and humanity in Christ, prophesied by Isaiah when he said in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, unto us a child is born, a son is given to us, and he will be our ruler. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. When our Lord Jesus declared in John 14, 20, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. He was referring to the depth and the complexity of this new life in Christ. When we are born of God, we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. And through Christ, we have become one with God. Is an amazing concept. Everybody needs to stop and say, what does it mean to me in my daily life that I'm born of God, that I have been made one with God through Christ? What does it mean? What should it mean in my life daily? What should it mean to my understanding of who I have become? And the powers and authorities that have been bequeathed to me, it is a meditation that everybody must undertake so that you and I can enter, no matter who we are, we can enter into the reality of sonship. Everyone who is born again must know that this relationship has awesome significance, particularly in the exercise of spiritual authority. Those who know who they have become in Christ exercise the full authority of their positions in Christ. And nobody who is born of God through, through Christ should live their lives in ignorance of this. When our Lord Jesus said in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, Jesus said to them, 
all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and shown. I am with you always to the very end of the age. Some may not understand that he was speaking of the authority we are called to wield in the world as a result of being born of God through Christ. Now, let us stop for a moment and think of it. I am in Christ as Christ is in me. Because I am born of God, I have become one with Christ and called to conform into his image daily. This is the challenge. And that's why I say to every believer, stop seeking the goal of your life. Every Christian has one goal. You can have different callings. You and I can have different callings. Okay? We have different callings. But we have one goal. And that goal is to be conformed into the image of Christ. Now, if I'm a lawyer, the experiences and the challenges I am going through in my profession, in my calling, in my work, they are there to enable me to be conformed into the image of Christ so that I will become a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or an accountant or a politician that is conformed to the image of Christ. So wherever I find myself in, in the pursuit of my calling, I am fully and practically representing Christ there. This is what this whole thing is all about. And every Christian needs to know that. For those God foreknew, the Bible says, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Now, just like God Almighty took of the spirit that was on Moses to put on the elders, so he has taken of the spirit that rested on Christ at his baptism to put upon us on, and in us. Let's take a look at that scripture in Numbers 11, 25. Then the Lord descended in the cloud and spoke to him. He took some of the spirit who was on Moses and placed the spirit on the 70 elders. As the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they never did again. Two men had remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad. The spirit rested on them also. They were among those listed, but had not gone out to the tent. They prophesied in the camp. Now, with the spirit in us, here is what we know. John chapter 16, verse 13 says, When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. Verse 14, he will glorify me, Jesus said, because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. In other words, the spirit that is given to us will reveal Jesus to us. Everything the Father has is mine, our Lord Jesus said. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. When a man is born again, is, is born of God. Or when a man is born again, he's born of God. And when he's born of God, the spirit, that's the difference. The Holy Spirit of God has taken up residence in their heart. So this is the spirit that makes us one with Christ. He is the spirit that comes from Christ. And he makes us one with Christ daily. As we go through life, make decisions, you know, uh, go right or go left. He's the one guiding us so that we will live life the way Christ would have lived it. If you were in our shoes. 
So this is the spirit that makes us one with Christ. As we are told, Romans 8, 15 to 17, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the spirit himself, okay, he testifies or bears witness together with our own spirit that we are God's children. And if children are also heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs or co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may be glorified together with him. Now, when we are born of God, the spirit of God comes into us bearing the seed of the life of God revealed through Christ. Now, day by day, as we pursue the will of God in God's ways, he conforms us. You see, it's those things that we do that conform us into the image of Christ with the advantage of a powerfully effective spiritual authority. Just the way our Lord Jesus Christ lived it. He had so much authority, which he exercised to bring about the purposes of God through his life on earth. And that's what you, are, you and I are commissioned to go and do. Bring about the purposes of God in your life, through your life, through my life in this world. Now, when we actualize this peculiar relationship with deepening understanding that we are not just called into some religion, we are not just called to come to church. No, we are called into a powerfully dynamic relationship that causes us to live the life of Christ in the world. We discover that God made provision in Christ for you and I to lead the life the way Christ lived it. He did not send us here, okay? He didn't send us here to fail, no. He made provision by his spirit so that you and I can stand up to pressure, stand up to all kinds of evil and witchcraft, stand up to all of them and win. Amen. So I can declare as a Christian, that I am born of God. I must understand that. What it means is that I live the life of Christ on earth. It's not that I declare that I'm born of God and I live carnally, you know, in the, on the earth. No, it, don't, it makes, it's a contradiction in terms, actually. It makes no sense of my declaration. Now, this is what the Bible says in 1 John 2. From verse 3. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love God. That is how we know we are living in Christ. Conclusion, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus lived it. In other words, if you and I declare to men and devils that we are born of God, then we are obligated to live our lives the way Jesus lived it. His. So those who say they live in God, those who say they're born of God, must live their lives the very same way our Lord Jesus Christ lived his own. Okay, now let us step um, forward and go to verse 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. And the word became flesh. Now, this is the most important story to come out of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember what we read at the beginning 
That's one. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. That is it. And then in verse 14, that word that was God in the beginning condescended and stepped into time and put on human flesh. The word became flesh. Okay? The word who was in the beginning with God, the word who was God, he put on human flesh and came and lived among us. That is, that is awesome. And you and I must discover the purpose of that incarnation. Because if we don't discover the purpose of the incarnation, then the true meaning of the incarnation is lost to us. It will just be another story in the Bible. It is important then to note that in this condescension, he did not cease to be God, no. But rather, as God, he clothed himself with human flesh, with all its limitations. And that's why the Bible says he was found in fashion as a man. Okay. Somebody had said, because it was, it's in Hebrews, you know, it's in Hebrews chapter 10, that when he was coming into the world, okay, he, he requested and received a body. And for you and I must discover why he did that. Okay. But to what purpose then did the son of God become the son of man? The answer is so that he can make sons of men to become sons of God. You see, I have spoken before about the divinity and the humanity in our creation. In Genesis chapter one, we are told that the, the, the God Almighty said, let us make man in our own image. That is the nature of God in man. And that nature was also residential there and it was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But then with the fall, everything fell apart, okay? Men and women, therefore, who are descendants of Adam and Eve in their fall, nobody was born before the fall. Everybody was born after the fall. All the men and women, they just became sons of men only. But when Jesus came, the seed of the life of God was restored in the man. Hallelujah. Only in those who believed. And so when you say you believe, you are not making a religious declaration. No, you are not making a religious declaration. You are making a spiritual statement that you have a sense of your origin and a sense of your belonging. When the son of God became the son of man, he reached down to the sons of men and lifted us up and seated us with himself in heavenly places. As we are told in Ephesians chapter two, verse six, so that sons of men can become children of God. Now, the only feasible way to do this, the only feasible way to attain to this is by faith. That's why the Apostle Paul in his letter to the, to the Romans, he spent considerable time explaining why it has to be by faith so that it can be, number one, universally available and number two it can be universally accessible you see if it was not like that then powerful people then strong people will corner it and then it will, they will not allow others to enter but because it's by faith justification is by faith to be made right with god is by faith it was universally accessible and universally av available. 
Okay? So that's why those who believe and receive the forgiveness of their sins through Christ, they are made sons of God and accepted before God as holy, unblameable, and unreprovable before God. Now, this statement, I want you, everyone under the sound of my voice, I want you to pay very special attention to it because it's a powerful, powerful foundation in the exercise of spiritual authority, particularly in spiritual warfare. You know, when devils and all their agents are contending with you for all that God has said about you in your life or God has provided for you in your life, you have the authority to enter into warfare, not to really fight them, but to enforce the victory of Christ. That's the, that's the amazing truth. That's the amazing truth, okay? Nobody in church, therefore, should be ignorant of this truth. The incarnation was to make sons of men become children of God so that they can share the same nature with God and live like the regions that we were created to be originally. That's why, you see, when you read the scriptures that said, to him that loved us, and first, in Revelations 1, 5, and 6, and first washed us from our sins in his own blood. What does that mean? He knew that there was no way in our natural state that we can ever appear before the holy God. No, that, that the power of his holiness will consume us. And so what he did was first to wash us from our sins in his blood. And then after that, like the Bible says in the sixth verse, he made us to be kings and priests unto God, unto his God. That is it. You know, when they, they, they take you and I from, where, well, from, from wherever they pick us up and through faith bring us into God's presence and then empower us, they make us kings and priests so that when we pray, we exercise spiritual authority, we rule by decrees, we create orders. And there are many people who don't know what this thing is really all about. Here is what it means. You see, when you, as a, as a king and priest unto God, you enter into the Holy of Holies and you find out the mind of God, then but the same way you found it out by faith, the same way you come and decree it by faith. And do you know what um, uh, um, uh, happens after that? The angels, they run on those decrees to establish the purposes of God in your life. It's amazing. You know, sometimes, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you learn from all other people, particularly those who have gone before us, other people's experiences, what it means to know that you have authority. Um, I read a story about uh, Smith Wigglesworth, you know, uh, apostle of faith, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, that he was invited to pray for somebody that was uh, out of their minds for whatever reason. And Smith Wigglesworth went there and he said, devil, I command you in the name of Jesus, get out of him and never re-enter him. Or words to that effect. And then Smith turned and left. Then the people who called him ran after him and said, Brother Smith, the man is still mad. And Brother Smith turned and said to them, I have given the command. I have given the command. And then the next day they came to his crusade and said, Brother Smith, you know what? That man is normal now. He said, yes, I know he would be. I'm not in the business of dragging demons out of people. Mine is to give the order. The angels know their job. I see, and that's how you begin to understand the exercise of spiritual authority. By, all by faith and all based on what Christ has done. And so it is not for nothing that he made you and I holy before God, as we shall see. It is not for nothing. It is so that we can be empowered. That's why I say nobody in church should be ignorant of this truth. 
The incarnation was to make sons of men into sons of God so that you and I can share the nature with God and live like regents we are created to be. We must always remember that incarnation is about the empowerment of the sons of men. Anyone who has been born of God through Christ must rise to embrace the power of God revealed through our salvation in Christ. It's amazing. You know, it is simply amazing when you see this work. You know, you kneel down, you sense something that is wrong, the spirit tells you, 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 you pray with the words quickened by the spirit, you go to sleep. And that's all, all taken care of. It's amazing. You only need to experience it to believe it. Now, anyone who has been born of God, therefore through Christ, must rise to embrace the power of God in our salvation. Let us look at it this way. We were oppressed by sin, the world and the devil. Temptations and lusts of the flesh held us in bondage and away from the glories of our creation as children of God. Then came the Son of God to demonstrate in the same flesh in which we live daily that it is possible to be tempted in every way and still stay away from sin as revealed in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested and tempted as we are yet without sin. Now, it is therefore important for you and I to really enter into this. You know, don't, don't be listening to those who say that, no, you and I cannot live godly lives. Yes, we cannot live what we call sinless perfection. No, it's not possible. But we can live godly. That's why the Bible says be mature. You know, as many as are mature. Many as are perfect, that means mature. So let us run down the list of the benefits of the incarnation of Christ to us. It's important. Now, the very first one is the most important. It is the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our souls. The scripture that brings it out very powerfully is in Colossians 1 19, from 19. The Bible says, for in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's the divine choice that Jesus should come here with all the fullness of God in him. Verse 20, and through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Okay, he, Jesus shed that blood to wash away every sin. First John 1, 7, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's an amazing statement. Now, verse 21 says, and you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death so as to present you whole and blameless and irreproachable before him. Now, everyone must ask himself, why did God go to all this length to make me holy, unblameable, irreproachable before him? Be, not, 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 not in the world, no, before him. It is so that when I appear before him, I will be holy. And then meet that compatibility criteria. Two cannot work together unless they agree. And he did not uh, 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 insist that I must produce that. 
I used to come before him. No, he provided it for me in Christ. Okay. But then the Bible didn't stop there. He says that all this holy, blameless, and irreproachable before him is dependent, provided. Verse 23 said, you continue. You not that, not that you and I one day gave our lives to Christ, and then they did, they gave us all these benefits, all this um, gift of holiness, and all of this, and then we drifted off to go and do our own thing our own way. Oh no, the Bible didn't say that. He said, provided you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel. That is it. You see, it's not just about coming. It's about continuing in Christ steadfastly, loyally, obediently. And then you can enter into the fullness of it. Now, this, this is the secret to the power, as we will see. That continuing, it's not, only, it's not just about what has been done for us. It is what we now continue to do after that. Now, resulting from the forgiveness of our sins then, and making us holy, unblameable, and irreprovable before God, is that great potential for the empowerment of the forgiven. You see, they didn't forgive just to let you and I alone. No, they forgave so they can empower and have men and women who represent God on the earth. That's what it's about. They didn't uh, uh, forgive you all your sins so that you and I can sit around and play church. No, they forgive us so that we can bring light in a world of darkness. Now, let us look at this uh, closely in, uh, in, uh, in um, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 6. It said, then the angel told Joshua, the high priest, that the Lord Almighty has said, if you obey, if, you know, like Shakespeare said, and as you like it, there's more virtue in if, if contingent, consequent to, as a result of, if you obey my laws, you see, everybody should know the power of that if. If you obey my laws and perform the duties I've assigned you, then you will continue to be in charge of my temple and its courts, okay? Authority. And I will hear, this is it, I will hear your prayers just as I hear the prayers of the angels who are in my presence. Now, the, 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 the angel was saying to Joshua, because Joshua was cleaned out, you know, by sovereign grace, you know. The Bible said the man was filthy. But then he said, I reject all the accusations. I, 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 I clean you up. I change your clothing. I put a new uh, uh, headgear meter for you so that you're completely cleansed from head to toe. But then the angel called him aside and said, the purpose of all of this is that God wants to empower you, but you must continue. You see, you didn't do anything to enter into this, but for you to be empowered, you must continue. And that's where many people get it wrong. You know, you have to continue. Because this is what the, the angel said to Joshua. I want to hear your prayers. Like I hear the prayers of the angels who continue in their calling and in obedience. And then in verse 8, he said, listen then, Joshua, you who are the high priest, and listen, you fellow priests of his, you that are the sign of a good future, I will reveal my servant who is called the branch. Now, Joshua was first cleansed, like I said, of all <laughs> sin through sovereign grace. Then the angel admonished him to walk in obedience to and holiness before the Lord. Now, you are not now walking in holiness to be accepted. You're already accepted. You are walking in holiness to be empowered. 
This is the process of spiritual empowerment that releases the power of the resurrection into the life of the believer. When you walk, you and I walk in obedience. We do as God says. We go where he sends. You know, we obey him. That's what happens. Salvation is by sovereign grace, but empowerment is through obedience and a holy walk of faith before the Lord. There is a reason for that. And our Lord Jesus Christ revealed it. Okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ revealed it in John chapter 8, verse 26, where he said, I have much to say about you, much to condemn you for. The one who sent me, however, is truthful, and I tell the world only what I have heard from him. They did not understand that Jesus was talking to them about the Father. So he said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Then you will know that I do nothing on my own authority, but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. That's, that's the simple way of understanding the life of Christ. Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will. I do what the, the Father has asked me to do. I say only what the Father has asked me to say. You see, I do not say them uh, to, do, to achieve this or achieve that. Only what the Father wants. And that's why he was always in power. Always. Now, lifting up Jesus. He said, when you lift me up. When you lift me up. Lifting up Jesus is his way of talking about going to die on the cross for our sins. You know? That is it. Jesus had all that God wanted him to do in focus. You know? And he embraced them fully and fulfilled them to the glory of God. Now, I, I, I want to show you uh, where he said this again in John chapter 3. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. That is it. Our Lord Jesus Christ was focused, totally focused, on his mission and commissioned by God. So, lifting him up, as the serpent was lifted in the wilderness. It speaks of doing the will of God on earth. Whatever it is, God demands as it is done in heaven and no matter the cost. He chose to do all that in order to establish salvation and empowerment for the children of God who come to God through him. This is why the apostle Paul, you know, having looked at it thoroughly, came up with this to the, Philippian, to the Philippian church. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. He made himself. I love that statement. God didn't make him. The world didn't make him. Circumstances didn't make him. By choice, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of the bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. In verse 9, therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, the coming of the Holy Spirit, according to his promise, is to see the root to our empowerment. From the moment he indwells us, he becomes the power source within us. Just as our Lord Jesus promised in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So the Holy Spirit came to replace 
the physical presence of Jesus for the apostles and, to, and for us. It is for this reason, therefore, that those who come to Christ taste and are tasting what the Bible calls the powers of the age to come. That tasting it now, as revealed in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. And they have tasted the good word of God. They have tasted the powers of the age to come. They fall away to renew them again to repentance. In other words, if you have truly experienced Christianity and you backslide and you never came back, the Bible says that you are putting the Son of God to an open shame. And the only thing that is left for you is judgment. Now, so let us, let us go very quickly. Let us know that believers in Christ have experienced and are experiencing these four things. Okay, they have been enlightened, number one, by the truth as it is in Christ. Number two, that light we read earlier is the very life of Christ. See, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Okay? They have also tasted the heavenly gift of salvation of their souls. You know, it's amazing. You know, I say to people, you know, the day I gave my life to Christ, the Holy Spirit just said to me, go and write your name down. That's where you belong. And I went back to that hall, wrote my name down. And then that's it. I kept, I started having revelations, you know, immediately after. Well, Jesus himself, you know, said to me in a dream, it is I, be not afraid. You know, I mean, what does a man do to deserve such a thing? Nothing. This is the awesomeness of the grace of God. So they have tested the heavenly gift of salvation of their souls. Number three, they have experienced the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is such an awesome experience. Particularly if you have the privilege of the communion of the Holy Spirit, you hold dialogue with him and he can unveil the mind of God to you in, or in various situations and circumstances. We may not have the time to, to share testimonies about this, but it's an awesome experience, you know, when the Holy Spirit is actually telling you what to do. And then finally, they have tasted the good word of God, who is our Lord Jesus Christ himself as Lord and Savior. And then the fifth one, they have tasted the powers of the age to come. Now, 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 what exactly is the powers of the age to come. This is the power of the, of the, of the, of the uh, millennial reign of Christ. You know, the Bible says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. But we know that not every knee is bowing now. But in the millennium, the Bible says, he will rule the world with a rod of iron. There will be enforcement. It will no longer by choice, no. And the Bible says that there are people alive in this age who have tasted the powers of that age to come where you enforce the will of God through spiritual authority and every believer must experience that for himself and know that it is really true that you can experience and taste the powers of the age to come so that, that these are the benefits of the incarnation he didn't stay in heaven and, and telling us what to do. He came here, paid a price so that we can become children of God and then we can be empowered. Now, those who have tasted the good word of God know the experience of indwelling Christ by whose example and inspiration they walk daily in both vertical love and horizontal love. That is the essence of the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the indwelling presence of Christ. You walk in vertical love. You love God with all your heart. And that translates in your life and my life to obedience. You do. We do as God says. No matter how we feel or what we think. We just do as God says. Okay. And then in the, at the horizontal level, we walk in love. You know, and the Bible actually says in that Ephesians chapter 3 scripture that 
when we walk in the multiple dimensions of the love of Christ, is is length, you know, can it can accommodate and breadth that can accommodate and depth that can reach deep, no matter how low, no matter how high, it can reach people with the love of Christ. So when we are when we begin to live that type of life, said the life of God will begin to be revealed through us. We'll be filled with all the fullness of God. It's amazing the kind of experience. Every, everyone who is careful, everyone who is methodical, everyone who is uh, uh, asking and receiving grace to follow Christ, they can, they can truly see their lives changing and the people around them will be acknowledging and indeed their lives are changing. So let us note uh, when we walk in love like Christ, we are progressively being filled with the fullness of God. And this is the reason why the word became flesh and came to live among us. And this is why the son of God became the son of man. So that sons of men could become children of God. Now, very uh, uh, briefly, as we, as we close, um, we, we'll get into this um, a lot more. Incarnation and the glory. We must note that the incarnation was the harbinger of terrest terrestrial glory. Okay, first we had to behold the glory of what nature it is revealed in John 1 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the glory of God in his life. The glory as of the only begotten son of God and this glory, remember our Lord Jesus bequeathed to the church in John 17 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, verse 23, and the glory, verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them the same way you love me. So let us, let us uh, halt here meanwhile, but let everyone know that it's a vision, it's an ambition, it's a desire, it's a burning desire to live the life of Christ. And so share, experience, be part of the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And Amen. use that power to bring glory to God in your life in your life. You see, the, the, the work is enormous. Nobody can do it their own and do your own. And that's why everybody needs to know about it. So that wherever you are, you'll be exercising spiritual authority to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Doctor. We have, we have quite a few questions. Uh, the first one, as someone wants you to go back to your reference in Numbers, it says, clarify what it means that God took some of the spirit of Moses and put it on the 70 elders. Oh, that's exactly what he said. You know, it may be um, it may be communication issues, but what it means is that Moses and those elders are going to minister under the same anointing, under the same wisdom, under the same insight. That's what it means. So when they are judging, it's like Moses is judging because the same spirit. That's really what it means. You couldn't read uh, uh, more than that into it. So, doctor. Is, is this symbolic that God says he took from Moses and put on them? Couldn't he have filled them? I think the, the, the allusion is, couldn't he have filled them as I'm, well? I'm telling you that is the person writing it. Is that what, he's telling you what happened, and he's trying to make you and I understand it. That is the same spirit that was on Moses that was put on the elders. That's all. Don't okay, read okay. more than that into it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The second question is, in practical terms, how does our life announce that we are his and not just deeply religious churchgoers. Oh, it, it, it's everything begins to be revealed, you know, in the way you conduct your own affairs. You see, um, uh, um, um, a, a, a young lady said that uh, they've, been, they've been telling me that when they go to this office, they, you know, they collect bribes for this, collect bribes for this. So she said she knelt down and prayed the Lord. I'm not going to give anybody anything. And she went through the same experience. She didn't uh, give anybody anything. And she got uh, what everybody was getting. And, 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 and see, when you hear such a story and you're going to the same office, you get inspired. You know, so, ah, 
the God they're serving is not different from the one they're serving. If such favor, mm-hmm. such a, it can be granted them, ah, then it can be granted me too. And then you go there, you, 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 you pray, you, 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 you speak, you, you take authority over all, all corrupt uh, uh, spirits, and, and favor comes to you. And you realize, ah, this is really true. This is really working, you know. Well, thank you, sir. The next question is, says, sir, please throw more light on the portion of scripture that says, um, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. I think that's Acts 2, 22. Yes, I recognize, uh, okay. then it says, um, we need more clarity because Jesus was God as man. Why and how did he need the approval? You know, when oh, the no. scripture says, you see, Jesus they, of Nazareth and approved of God. Yes, because he didn't live his life here as God. You see, that is, that is because if he lived his life here as God, ah, you and I are not God. You know, so he we're lived his life here. Example. Yes, we are following his example. He lived his life here as a man. And that's why he, he was tempted, you know. So when he was being nailed on the cross and he said, hey, Father, forgive them for them, they don't know what they're doing. He was teaching us forgiveness. Even in the face of injustice, you know, he lived his life here as a man. So it wasn't that, um, you know, like some people, in fact, it got to a point where some people, because they kept looking at his life, they felt that his body couldn't have been real body. You know, those are some of the, um, uh, um, 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 what did they call them now? Uh, Yes, Gnostics, but heresies uh, uh, that that, that, uh, occurred in the past because they couldn't imagine. But the whole idea of asking us to follow in his footsteps is because he lived his life here as a man, as a human being. And so mm-hmm. when we study his life carefully, and one of the, you know, one of the things that came to me powerfully as an individual is that John 5, 19, that says the son can do nothing of his own self except what he sees the father do. There is no magic to it. If you and I have to pray to God to guide us in everything, Lord, unless unless you guide me and lead me, I will not go anywhere. So you see, by the time you get to that point in your life, things begin to straighten out. In fact, I told people that I, I, tell, I tell people that uh, when you put your life in the will of God in every area, you find that things are working together better because they're all under the same control. You know, instead of um, uh, um, going to, um, like in, you say in Lagos, going to Keja and find that you need to pick up something in uh, Badagri. No, no, they say that thing you are looking for in Keja, go and get it in uh, Aja. And then when they say, oh, you need to go to Badagri, you are headed in the same direction. In other words, your life is not torn here and there and there and there. No, once that starts happening, you have to go and check those controls, you know, because you see, our Lord Jesus Christ moved like that, you know, he moved like that always. They say, go to Jerusalem. You say, ah, the Jews want to kill me. The Jews don't want to kill you. Okay? So I can go to Jerusalem anytime I like. Heaven has to signal me that it's okay. So he lived a life that is reproducible. That's what the Bible is saying. And thank you, sir. Somebody wants us to, somebody wants you to throw more light on the difference between living godly and sinless perfection. It's still not very clear. Oh, no, no, it's very clear. Sinless perfection is that you never, you have never, ever since you are born again, you have never put a foot wrong. No, there is no such thing now, you know. But um, godliness is that, um, you know, uh, um, you, are, you are blameless. You know what they call blameless, you know? You know, the words, you don't volitionally do what is wrong. No, no, you've passed that. What, what, you know this thing is wrong, and you are still doing it. No, they don't do that when you are when you are godly. It doesn't matter what the consequences may be, but sinless perfection means um, you never say the wrong thing, you never use the wrong word. No, that is not possible. Only Jesus did that. Thank you, sir. For our final question, sir. It says, does it mean that when we have not experienced, I'm mean, sorry, it says during your teaching that we only have to experience to believe. Does it mean that when we have not experienced it, we should not believe? 
sorry. No, 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 no. Maybe, maybe you know what, 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 I, what I actually meant was that uh, you can be believing it, but the moment you start experiencing it, you know, you enter into the fuller reality. It's, it's like everything else. You know, you, 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 you were told that um, uh, you can heal the sick. You believe it, but you've never really tried to pray for the sick and see them healed. But one day you summed up the courage to lay hands on a sick person and rebuke the infirmity in their body. And you see them testify, come back and testify that, wow, I'm healed. I can't believe it, yes. So both, I mean, it happened to myself and my roommate when we were in the university, when we started hearing about um, every Christian can lay hands on the sick. Uh, one boy who was um, uh, 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 referred to UCH, we're still in, uh, you are in the time. He sauntered into a room uh, that has been trying to get an uh, appointment with the consultant. He's been there for so long. You know, he said, well, we can pray for you. We can pray for you, you know. And then we laid hands on him and prayed for him. Well, to be quite honest, we are not expecting much to happen. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> you know, but to our greatest surprise, he turned up two days later so excited. He said, I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't need to see the doctor again. I'm going back to the East. Myself and my roommate were looking at each other. So that's what I'm saying. You know, so from that day, that thing that you're hearing, that is possible, is possible. Now that you have experienced it, ah, you can then warm yourself into it with no mm -hmm. uh, vigor. Sorry, doctor, just one last one. Um, it seems someone wants you to further explain about Jesus living as God here on earth. He says they're confused because they always believe that Jesus lived 100% as God and man. I think, you know, I think it's a confusion about Jesus living as man, not as oh, God. Yes. Uh, <laughs> of course now. He lived here as a man, even though he was God. But the Bible says he put his deity down. Didn't you hear it? He taught it of uh, uh, not robbery to be equal with God. He laid aside some scriptures say, he, some translations will say he laid aside his deity. Okay. It's not that he lost his deity. He didn't lose it. This is the point. He didn't lose his deity, but he laid it aside and put on himself the limitations of humanity so that he can bring the sons of men to make them sons of God. Okay. So, so uh, um, he lived his life. That's why he lived his life here by faith also. Because if he was living uh, like God on earth, he won't pray. God doesn't pray. But while he was here on earth, he prayed. So he had the limitations of humanity. That's the point. Fully God, fully man. But the nature of God, he didn't use it here. He used the nature of man. And so what he did, all the miracles and authority he exercised, he exercised by the anointing of the Holy Spirit because that's what he expects us, sons of God through Christ, to do by the anointing of the Holy Spirit also. He lived the life we should believe. That's what we call that Jesus actually modeled the God kind of life for us. So we can see an example to follow in our lives. Thank you very much, doctor. Will you pray for us uh, then we'll take our offering? Lord, we are so grateful that um, you are bringing us into this realization of who we really are in Christ so that we can arise and exercise the authority of our birth and calling in Christ. Oh, Jesus, please help every single one under the sound of my voice to enter into this, that there will be a rising from this place, men and women who are empowered, and who are seeing God being glorified in their lives, who are no longer intimidated by the devil and the world. But Lord, are standing strong and firm in what you did on the cross of Calvary. We thank you, O Lord our God. We give you praise, for you will turn sons of men into children of God through all this. For it is in Jesus' powerful name we have prayed. Amen. 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 That's okay. Amen. Pastor okay, please take the offering. Hello. Um, let somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Well, I think, um, like we say, offering time is blessing time. I hope as we bring our offerings, we bring our offerings with thanksgiving, with joy, and the opportunity we've had to learn at the feet of Jesus. Uh, like I always like to remind us, this is a privilege. If you think about the number of people here compared to the number that could be here, then you realize that like it's actually a privilege to be part of this teaching and part of this gathering. Let us pray. Please remember that in giving our offerings, we're giving online um, to, the, um, to the accounts that are displayed on the screen. Um, we give to um, Careless account or we give to the Worldwide Life Link account with Fidelity on behalf of Careless. The offering account is 508-005-0643 for offering. And the project account is 508-009-9709 for the project. That's if you want to support this ministry as a as a, as a project, or if you want to support the, the, the um, CSR, which means that the giving of the ministry, you know, helping the needy and defending the weak, then you give to 401-144-5486, which is also a fidelity account. I'm sure we all see the account numbers. For those that are giving internationally or outside Nigeria, I'm sure on the chat box, you will see the account details to use. Let us pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Father, we just Amen. want to say thank you for this opportunity to gather again. We never take it for granted. We want to bless your holy name and worship you. Thank for what you are doing in our individual lives. Thank for reminding us again that this Christian life is, a, that the normal Christian life is an extraordinary life. That we have an incredible opportunity to live a life that will be filled with your glory, with your presence, with the Holy Spirit, and to go there and just make an impact on our world. Please help us individually, for this is the essence of what we're learning. Help us to go and live this life and bring maximum glory to your name and blessings here on earth, Father. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. I'd like to spend just a, a short moment to uh, share with us all the other meetings that we have. We have virtual prayer meetings every morning at 5.30 a.m. And then we also pray every evening at 6.30 p.m., except on Monday evenings, where we have the Antioch Bible study at 6. And then on Wednesdays, we pray for all nations by name from 12 o'clock, 12 noon. And then on Saturdays, we meet at the KLS Center for the worship experience from 8 a.m. And on the fourth Saturday of every month, a doctor has a relationship and marriage clinic, seminar, exposition, workshop, call it what you may, to help strengthen our relationships, our marriages, our homes. Please join us for any of these meetings. Now we're going to go into a time of prayer. Uh, it lasts about an hour. We'll, we'll first start with the global worship. 